Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much. Please, have a seat. Thank you. Thank you, MIT. I am, I am hugely honored to be here. It's always been a dream of mine to visit the most prestigious school in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Oh, oh. Oh. Hold on a second. Certainly the most prestigious school in this part of Cambridge, Massachusetts. And I'll probably be here for a while. I understand a bunch of engineering students put my motorcade on top of Building 10. I, uh, what, here, here, this tells you something about MIT. Uh, everybody hands out periodic tables. <laughs> What's up with that? <laughs> I want to thank uh, all of you today uh, for the warm welcome and for the work that all of you are doing to generate and test uh, new ideas that hold so much promise for our economy and for uh, our lives. And in particular, I want to thank two outstanding uh, MIT professors, uh, Eric Lander and uh, the person you just heard from, Ernie uh, Moniz, for their service on my Council of Advisors on Science and Technology. And uh, they have been hugely uh, helpful to us already on looking at, for example, how the federal government can mo most effectively respond to uh, the threat of the H1N1 virus, and so I'm very grateful to them. We've got some other special guests here I just want to acknowledge very briefly. Uh, first of all, uh, my great friend and a champion of science and technology here in uh, the great uh, Commonwealth of Massachusetts, uh, my friend Deval Patrick is here. Our Lieutenant Governor, Tim Murray, is here. <laughs> Attorney General Martha Coakley is here. <laughs> Auditor of the Commonwealth, Joe DiNucci, is here. <laughs> the Mayor of the great city of Cambridge, Denise Simmons, is in the house. The Mayor of Boston, Tom Menino, is not here, but he met me at the airport, and he, he is doing great. <laughs> he sends best wishes. Uh, somebody who really has been an all-star uh, in Capitol Hill uh, over the last 20 years, but certainly over the last year on a whole range of issues, uh, everything from Afghanistan to clean energy. Uh, great friend, John Kerry. Please give uh, John Kerry a round of applause. And a wonderful member of Congress, uh, I believe this is your district, is that correct, Mike? Uh, Mike Capuano. Please give Mike a big round of applause. Now, uh, Dr. Moniz is also the director of MIT's energy initiative called MITEI. Uh, and he and President Hockfield uh, just showed me some of the extraordinary energy research being conducted at this institute. Windows that generate electricity by direct, directing light to solar cells, uh, lightweight, high-powered batteries that aren't built but are grown. Th that was neat stuff. Uh, uh, engineering viruses to create, uh, to create batteries, um, more efficient lighting systems that rely on nanotechnology, innovative engineering that will make it possible for offshore wind power plants to deliver electricity even when the air is still. Uh, and it's a reminder uh, that all of you are heirs to a legacy of innovation, not just here but across America that has improved our health and our well-being and helped us achieve 
on parallel prosperity. I was telling uh, John and Duvall on the ride over here, you just get excited being here and seeing these extraordinary young people uh, and the extraordinary leadership of Professor Hockfield uh, because, because it taps into something essential about America. It's the legacy of daring men and women who put their talents and their efforts into the pursuit of discovery. And it's the legacy of a nation that supported those intrepid few uh, willing to take risks on an idea that might fail but might also change the world. Even in the darkest of times that this nation has seen, it has always sought a brighter horizon. Think about it. In the middle of the Civil War, President Lincoln designated a system of land-grant colleges, including MIT, which helped open the doors of higher education to millions of people. A year a full year before the end of World War II, President Roosevelt signed the GI Bill, which helped unleash a wave of strong and broadly shared economic growth. After the Soviet launch of Sputnik, the first artificial satellite to orbit the Earth, the United States went about winning the space race by investing in science and technology, leading not only to small steps on the moon, but also to tremendous economic benefits here on Earth. The truth is, we have always been about innovation. We have always been about discovery. That's in our DNA. The truth is, we also face more complex challenges than generations past. A medical system that holds the promise of unlocking new cures is attached to a healthcare system that has the potential to bankrupt families and businesses and our government. A global marketplace that links the trader on Wall Street to the homeowner on Main Street to the factory worker in China, an economy in which we all share opportunity is also an economy in which we all share crisis. We face threats to our security that seek uh, – there are threats to our security that are based on those who would seek to exploit the very interconnectedness and openness that's so essential to our prosperity. The system of energy that powers our economy also undermines our security and endangers our planet. Now, while the challenges today are different, we have to draw on the same spirit of innovation that's always been central to our success. And that's especially true when it comes to energy. There may be plenty of room for debate as to how we transition from fossil fuels to renewable fuels. We all understand there's no silver bullet to do it. There's going to be a lot of debate about how we move from an economy that's importing oil to one that's exporting clean energy technology, how we harness the innovative potential on display here at MIT to create millions of new jobs, and how we will lead the world to prevent the worst consequences of climate change. There are going to be all sorts of debates, both in the laboratory and on Capitol Hill, but there's no question that we must do all these things. Countries on every corner of this earth now recognize that energy supplies are growing scarcer. Energy demands are growing larger, and rising energy use imperils the planet we will leave to future generations. And that's why the world is now engaged in a peaceful competition to determine the technologies that will power the 21st century. From China to India, from Japan to Germany, nations everywhere are racing to develop new ways to produce and use energy. The nation that wins this competition will be the nation that leads the global economy. I am convinced of that. And I want America to be that nation. It's that simple. Now, that's why the Recovery Act that we passed back in January makes the largest investment in clean energy in history, not just to help end this recession, but to lay a new foundation for lasting prosperity. The Recovery Act includes $80 billion to put tens of thousands of Americans to work developing new batteries.